Okay, so maybe we can just start back up and just get into some of the, the kind of what we came here to talk about. I wasn't intending on getting into so much deal, detail in that last section, but I appreciate the questions and I'm glad we got, if people were interested in that stuff, I'm glad we could cover and get the questions answered. So, um, and again, we'll see this, the same type of stuff that we've been doing and hopefully it'll be, start to get a little bit repetitive with the, with the vignettes that we're doing here. Um, so just a question back to the group. Um, is there anyone here that, who's doing PBPK modeling um, kind of regularly? Okay, just one? Okay. <laughs> when you say you, you do, do you mean like build the models? Yeah, build or use or... I use them. Use them, them. use them, build them, and interested in PBPK at all? Yeah. Okay, um, great. Um, so we've got two examples. Um, um, this one, this is this came from um, CPNT, PSP, um, just earlier this year, and it's a um, it's a PVBK model for uh, of rifampicin, and they're trying to predict drug-drug uh, interactions with uh, CYP3A uh, and 2C9, and um, there's some kind of OETP inhibition stuff. So, I'm not a PVBK modeler. I'm not a drug metabolism guy or a transporter guy, um, but this just I couldn't resist this because it was so well reported, and it's just. Uh, a really nice example to have in the um, this um, Sujiyama uh, group. Um, they just seem like they just put out just tons of um, nice examples, and they're all just really well documented. And so this took this model took me about um, I don't know, maybe three or four hours to just sit down and code up the the total um, DDI um, uh, model, right? So it's a we'll do two PBK PBPK models going on at the same time to, to code this up. Um, so I thought it would be a nice example um, um, just to walk through. Um, again, this is um, free and open source, and the, or the, it's the, uh, the model uh, kind of free, is a freely available. Um, but just to look at the PBK, the PBBK model here, um, so if you're not familiar with it, or maybe I should have this guy back here kind of uh, tell about it, but um, in terms of implementation, um, it's really not, that different than other models that we write, uh, this physiologically based, um, these PK models, but we just parameterize them, parameterizing them in a different way. So instead of thinking about so much about rate constants, rate constants and things like that, um, we kind of make a model where we've got these physiological compartments like muscle, skin, adipose tissue. Um, we know uh, kind of experimentally, kind of in, in, independent of the drug, um, what the volumes of those tissues might be. Um, we know what the blood flow is in and into those tissues and things like that. So we know that before we even worked on our on our the compound that we're we're doing, and so that we can take this model kind of in place, and then we can add drug specific things like um, partition coefficients and things like that that can either be kind of obtained experimentally or by kind of calculating them by some by a formula, um, and that we can kind of plug these into our models and we can get predictions in all these different compartments. So we've got a compartment there. We know the partition coefficient. Um, then we can get a prediction of these uh, 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 of, of the drug concentration in, in this compartment. These guys are interested in drug-drug interactions, um, and uh, um, so they've got um, these kind of compartments. You see in a lot of different models. Um, and there's this kind of complicated stuff going on down here with the uh, enterocytes, um, but they're really looking uh, here in um, this is their model for the liver. So we've got kind of blood flowing around the, this whole system, drugs distributing to kind of non-eliminating compartments. And then when it gets down to the uh, liver here, we've got this, this series of five compartments. Let me just blow this up, because it might be easier to talk about it. Um, this is for the rifampin here. And we've got this kind of hepatic kind of extracellular compartment. And then the drug can either diffuse into the intracellular compartment, or it can be um, actively taken up through this OATP through this active process, and then it can get eliminated from these these liver cells through the through the clearance. Um, and uh, so they're kind of looking at um, uh, this is if this is the model for the the for the rifampin. Um, let's see which model was the. I think this one up here was for the for the midazolam. Med um, and so that's kind of a well-known drug, 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 drug interaction. This midazolam model was a little bit simpler. They just didn't need this, um, this extracellular in the, in the kind of cellular compartments for the liver. And so these are just kind of a, lumped into a single unit. 
um, but they can there's still five of these compartments and then the the uh, uh, the I guess the midazolam can get uh, metabolized out of the out of liver compartment so in our model we're gonna run this DDI so we're gonna run a little bit um, with the rifampin model alone and just look at some auto induction um, so this rifampin kind of induces uh, CYP3A4 activity and we can see that as the dosing goes along that the we'll see changes in the in the rifampin uh, exposure um, and then we'll so we can we're we'll, so we're always going to be running with this kind of combined model so both things going at once um, we're, but we'll we'll simulate from just the rifampin piece to begin with and then we'll do both and we'll look at this influence of how this rifampin uh, kind of affects the exposure of the midazolam and then um, kind of ramp that up a little bit to look at some how that kind of varies with it with it with the rifampin dose um, yeah I, I think uh, kind of my goal here with these uh, when I was translating the model is that they give some nice um, kind of concentration time profiles that you can kind of try and match up and that kind of make sure that you're in the ballpark you've tried to translate things properly so this is the rifampin concentration um, on its own um, with at, with some different doses and they give it IV and, and orally um, and then they um, kind of come down here I mean there's more than we can kind of talk about here um, but we'll try and go after this figure too so I thought this was like a nice one to go grab so here um, in the black is the so this is the midazolam concentration versus time profile and the black is kind of their control and they, they, then they look at after uh, I think five days of rifampin daily of either 5, 10, 25, and 75. And you can see that the uh, midaz midazolam exposure gets um, smaller and smaller as they increase the rifampin dose. And that's due to that, the induction of the, of the 3A4 and, and probably the, uh, I think the UGT2 as well. So we'll try and kind of redo this at least and then uh, look at this figure D where we can kind of make a plot of these uh, 3A4 activities uh, versus time so. Okay, so um, so I'm gonna go in and um, load up my packages. And so the first thing we're gonna look at is just the rifampin PBBK. So we can load the model um, exactly the same way we did with those simple uh, uh, models. Um, it's just mread, um, and I'm going after this rifampin uh, midazolam model. Um, one thing that we didn't see is that when I'm doing project work, um, I give it the name of this model, um, and then this second argument is the directory that the that the model is in. Um, so if I just quickly flip over to my files, um, if I'm working in this docs directory, um, you can see that there's a models directory right here down here. And I've got all my models in there. And so that kind of keeps that out of my working directory. And it just keeps a lot of clutter from kind of coming up there. Um, but you don't have to do that, but I like to do it. Um, so we can take that model and read it in. Um, oops. I'm just going to restart this because something's not right. Sorry. Let's see if we can get better with this. Okay. Uh, okay, so we, we just did the same thing that we did. This is what I do a lot of times when I pick up a new model um, Is this we'll read it in and I can just print this out and just like we had before um, We've got all our compartments listed here. Um, now. We've got 41 compartments in the model um, The parameters um, I kind of got some long parameter names. So this kind of wraps kind of funny But we've got 61 parameters. So all the rifampin so like the the sort of the system parameters are shared so the volumes and the and the, and the blood flows, and then we've got um, kind of specific parameters for the rifampin uh, side and from the midazolam side. Um, but we look at it just the same that we, that we, that we did with, uh, with those simple PK models. Um, we can look at the, 
um, these are the parameters for the um, for this uh, for this model and uh, uh, you can kind of see what the values are we could change them but with that update command just like we did with a simple model um, kind of importantly um, so these are the compartments uh, for for this model um, and um, I kind of stuck with their naming convention for the for the compartments and things so this X gut lumen that's going to be the the kind of the gut compartment for the refampin model that's compartment number one and then it was um, M gut lumen I called is compartment number two so if we want to dose refampin we need to put it into the compartment one and then if we want to dose midazolam we'll put it into compartment two so just kind of like what we did with this other model I'm just going to do like a single 600 milligram dose of refampin this is that uh, event object that we had here. Uh, I gotta clear all this. Um, again, it's just a 600 milligram dose times one. It's going into compartment one here, um, and we can just take our the same workflow that we did before. Um, we take our model object. I'm gonna pass in this uh, this ref this uh, refampin. Uh, drug uh, dosing object and I'm only interested in, in C central so that's their um, the concentration in the central compartment um, for this refampin model I'm going to simulate out to two days and just plot it out we just get a plain old regular uh, refampin uh, uh, concentra concentration time profile um, no different than with that regular PK model but it's doing all this other stuff in the background um, and what I wanted to do is kind of just develop this a little bit and just kind of said because this is how I kind of got to understand the model is I want to just take um, I can take this uh, this this refampin object and I can call a mutate on it and so mutate is coming out of that dplyr package and I can say we'll change this and uh, uh, add like ii equals 24 so that's a 24 hour uh, dosing interval and I'm going to do up to 10 uh, total doses and so now I've got Kind of like the same object except it's uh i've got out to 10 doses here uh and then i'm just going to rerun this again and i'm going to change this end time out to 240 because i want to capture that out, out to those 10 days and now i can plot this um, output um and uh so this is just kind of that like that single dose that we had but now we're repeating and it's a little bit hard to tell on here, but you can kind of see that the, the peak is starting to go down over time. This like the peak is kind of slightly smaller. Kind of every day you do the extra dose. And I said, oh, I want to just investigate that a little bit and see what's going on. Um, so the rest of this is kind of doesn't have anything to do with energy solve, but I wanted to kind of generate some kind of useful output out of here. So um, I'm going to take my output. Um, that simulated output that we just looked at, I'm going to de derive a day column. And so that's just going to say, uh, let's take the floor. So we're going to take time and divide it by 24 and just turn it into the, the next lowest integer. Um, I'm going to group by the day and I'm going to calculate the AUC. So this is coming out of a, it's called a PKPD MISC package that's uh, developed by my friend uh, Devin Pasteur. Um, and this will just get the calculate, just calculate the AUC. We just have to give it the, the name of the time column and then the the variable that we want to summarize by and then I'm going to derive this um, percent AUC so I'm just going to say I want to take the AUC I'm going to divide it by the first AUC um, and then multiply it by 100 and I'm only going to take up to day 10 and we can just make a now this is just a again we're just we're just in regular kind of a regular data frame and you can do this any way you want but this is kind of like the workflow that we like to use and I can make a plot of this and so, okay, so this is showing this auto-induction of rifampicin metabolism. So this is the, AUC is a percent of the first day. So on day one, we're at 100%. And then by out to day 10, we're just, we've got almost a 30% decrease in AUC just by repeated rifampin, rifampin dosing. Um, so that just kind of shows that um, auto-induction process um, for that 600 milligram uh, a daily dose. And we can dig, dig in a little bit into this model and uh, so I'm going to take that output now. I'm going to say both um, CYP304 and UGT meta metabolic activity. 
are increased after multiple rifampin doses. Um, so I'll take the my simulated output and I'll just reshape it a little bit here. Oops. Um, it's kind of hard to see because I got a lot of output here, but I'm just kind of shaping this into a long format. So I can do, I can make a plot that looks like this. Um, this is digging into the model and um, this is a compartment that's in the model called CYP3A4 ratio. And it's in one of these uh, liver compartments. Um, and in the green line is for the 3A4 and then the orange line is for the UGT. And, and these compartments get initialized to a value of one. Um, and then um, as we dose, you can see this, uh, this UGT activity is increased almost up to maybe like increase of 75% from the baseline. Um, and then the, see if you can see the, a much bigger increase for the 3A4 um, um, by several fold um, by, the, the, by the time you get out to, uh, get out to day 10. We can kind of, so we, we can kind of see what's going on um, in the model um, that's kind of causing this, uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, lower uh, rifampin exposure um, as we kind of, re as, re as we dose repeatedly. Um, so let's look at this, uh, the rifampin uh, midazolam DDI. Um, and so uh, just, I, can, I kind of said this before, we want to just recall that our PBVK model is really a combination of two models, one for rifampin, one for midazolam. And so we need to set up uh, our dosing in interval um, where we're going to just take a, or our dosing object where we're just going to take a single three milligram uh, midazolam <coughs> dose down here and we're going to put that into compartment two. We're just going to put three milligrams in there. Um, I can just simulate that out. That's what that looks like for just the midazolam alone. Um, but we, what we want in our plot to look, see what this midazolam dose looks kind of on its own, and then after the seven days or whatever of rifampin, whatever we're going to do. So I'm going to try and do like the same uh, thing that they did in their plot. So I'm going to take, I'm going to make my rifampin object to be 75 milligrams daily for a total of seven. Um, and then I'm going to do this trick that we we talked about in the in the introduction, where I'm going to say, okay, do the um, do the rifampin dose, then wait minus 12 hours, and then do the midazolam dose. Um, and we do minus 12 hours because I I think I think what they did is that they kind of dose the midazolam out, and they kind of gave this, or they dose the rifampin out, and then they gave this midazolam dose kind of just after the the last rifampin dose. So. I just want that to move back in time by 12 hours. And so you can wait like negative times two to, to just say, just uh, just go back 12 hours from when that previous regimen ended. And we get this uh, object or this, this event object that'll get what we want. Um, and then I'm just gonna derive this um, midazolam object. So I kind of made this, this has got this nice, uh, it's got all the timing down that we want. And so I'm gonna use this filter function that again comes out of dplyr. And this just says, just give me the rows in this this rifampin midazolam object where the compartment is equal to two. Um, and then so now we've got, um, this is what this looks like. And this just says, I want a midazolam dose at the same time. Like, so I want it at time 156. And I just want it at the same time for the midazolam alone as we want for the midazolam plus rifampin, right? Because we want to compare these. So I just want to dose at that same time. Um, uh, we can, uh, there's a function called as data set. This is another one of these helper functions that just takes these event objects and it kind of combines them together. Um, it doesn't do too much, but it basically takes that midazolam object um, as ID one, and we've just got that single dose out uh, around day seven, and then ID two is gonna be the combination. So it's gonna do the rifampin, and then it's gonna do the midazolam. And that as data set really just kind of combines these objects, and it's got this awareness of so that each per each uh, uh, dosing profile has its own ID in there, right? If we if we kind of just combine these together, it would seem like it was coming from the same individual. But we want two different profiles in the simulation, and so that's our our kind of both object. So we can simulate this out. Um, we take our model object. Um, I'm just going to look at. I'm just going to look for my the midazolam concentration here. 
and I'm gonna I think in their figure they just did like the first 10 hours so I tried to match it up as close as I could um, and then I'm just gonna filter um, the result out just to get greater than or equal to 156 because I want to just start this at where, wherever the midazolam dose was um, and then the rest of this is just kind of getting it ready for plotting and when, when I make this plot we get this uh, profile so again in the green is just the midazolam alone and then the orange is the midazolam after the rifampicin Yep. For rifampin, do they use an imatran E250 for the induction, or how do they put into the model the induction? Yeah, so the, I can go into the, the code a little bit, but yeah, they do. They use an Emax and an EC50, um, and then there's like a there's a degradation uh, mm -hmm. parameter for the enzyme. Yeah, KDEG. Yeah. Do they do it differently for the gut versus the liver? Do they have a different KDEG for the? I think it was the same for the. I think it's like tight, it looks like a different parameter, but if you look at their parameter table. I think they said we just use the same for both. Yeah. Although that's, I can't, I'm not 100% on that, but I, I kind of thought I remember reading that. Any other questions just so far about what's going on? And we'll, I'll, I'm going to dig into this model a little bit just to look to see what's happening. Um, and just to show you a little bit how, how the, the model file is structured. So I kind of just thought, well, this is kind of nice, and um, this is like I think this. I was so I was trying to go after a, like one of their figures in their paper, just to say like, yeah, we can reproduce this, and that kind of gave me some confidence that the model was translated right. But I was like, okay, what else can we do with this? Uh, what else can we do with this um, that might be kind of helpful? Because sometimes they're well, let's just go back here. If you kind of scroll down in here, they've got this plot here. Um, where they're looking at different uh, rifampicin uh, treatment regimens, so doses and durations on the left, and then that's combined with different midazolam uh, doses and regimens and routes on the right. And they're looking at this midazolam ACR, so this is this at AUC ratio. Um, for like, and they, you know, sometimes they're down around 10 milligrams per day, uh, and then sometimes they're at 600 milligrams per day. Um, and so I said, well, let's just go ahead and just make this relationship. Let's just figure out what the relationship is between this AUC ratio and the rifampin dose. Um, so, um, so I stuck with a three milligram. Uh, so we're right, we're right here. Um, and what I did is I just worked in R. This is, this is regular R code um, where I create a little function in R where I say, okay, I've got a certain rifampin dose. I've got a certain midazolam dose. I always went with a three milligram dose. Um, and now I'm just going to do what I did in the example, Is that except I'm just going to use the doses that I passed into the function. I simulate here um, with a certain, with a, this combined event object. Uh, we're going to filter down, and then we're going to uh, label what our rifampin dose was and our midazolam dose. And this is just going to return uh, a data frame out of this. Um, and so once you kind of get this function down that just does, right, so I can just, I can take a sim, um, sim DDI for um, 600. And so that'll just simulate that whole sequence for the, my 600 milligram dose. So I can just test it out to do it once. Um, but I'm gonna do this, uh, this is a function out of the per package. It's called MAPDF, and it's just going to go through the sequence of doses from 0 to 600 milligrams. I'm going to look every 10 milligrams, and then it's going to do my simulation, and it's going to simulate all that stuff, and it's going to return it all as a single data frame. So I can just, once I set that function up, I can easily just simulate out a bunch of these different scenarios. Um, and so now I've got all that data simulated, and I'm just going to take that thing here, I'm going to group it by the rifampin and the midazolam dose, and I'm going to calculate the AUC. Um, and then I'm going to calculate, just like we did before, that percent AUC of the day one. So now we get this relationship of this kind of midazolam AUC as a fraction, as a percentage of the day one. And we can see that when, when you go all the way out to that uh, 600 milligram dose, you know, it's like, I don't know you get like 85% reduction or it's like 15% of the day of the uh, for of, for at the 600 milligram dose compared to the control 
um, with norifampin. Um, and I think I kind of looked at a couple of these, and I think it was um, kind of somewhere in the ballpark of being close to what they were getting for the for these kind of points here. So it was kind of nice. I mean, they reported this well, and you know, I don't know, maybe I made a mistake in there. I don't know, but like we we're, it was kind of nice to be able to take the model and simulate out what they did, and you kind of use it as this validation. Like they reported it so well. And so now we've got some confidence in the model that we can go ahead and use this um, for our modeling and simulation activities. Um, and hopefully if it made for kind of an uh, interesting case study. Uh, we didn't look like a ton at the, uh, uh, at the, at the, the model specification format, um, but it's really, um, it's really pretty simple. There's just, um, uh, maybe two or, th or there's maybe three or four main sections that you need to so one, that you need to be uh, that you really need to use um, there's this problem section at the top where I can just write anything I want so I put the citation up there um, and a links to the paper just to make sure that they got kind of credit for the for the work and things um, there's a parameter block that looks like this um, and I can just name my parameters and give them values um, if you see this double front slash, that's just a comment. So that's the standard comment character in C++. And really, this is just like brute force. I mean, this is just, um, you can have as, as many parameter blocks as you want, but so I kind of group them according to kind of common parameters so I know where to look because, um, I mean, this, this whole file is almost 400 lines of code. Um, um, but you're just, it's just coming up with putting the parameters in and giving them values. Um, they parameterize this. Um, uh, I just come down here. Uh, oops. So, like all like the flows and things like that were parameterized like on a kind of by per kilo on a per kilo basis. Um, and so this is liters. So all these flows are liters per hour per kilogram. That's how they reported them, and I just stuck with that. And when I did this, so these are all just parameters, names, and values. Um, and then there's a block if you're familiar with non-mem this is like dollar pk and so this is like where you can write analyt like uh, algebraic expressions to derive other parameters they're going to they're going to get used to advance the system so they put in so i have as parameters like the per kilo flows and everything and so now i need to go in here and i need to derive a new parameter names um, that are kind of that that are kind of result from when you take those per kilo values and you multiply them through by weight um, and so you can just reparameterize the model or kind of multiply through by some covariate, um, and that's in dollar main. There's a lot of those. Um, when you want to specify a compartment, you just do this compartment block, and then you just name the compartments. Um, these are in order. So, so remember, I was looking at this X gut lumen was the first compartment. And that's because I listed it first. And I can change that to the second compartment by just moving o moving it over one. Um, but like once you get past these dosing compartments. I mean, the order of these just, they don't matter. There's the compartment number just never kind of factors into the, into the model. I mean, it does like under the hood, but as far as, as a modeler is concerned, you don't need to worry about it. Um, we said that there was some compartments that were initialized to a value, and that's just called this init block. Um, and so these kind of, the, these ratio compartments, so we had five lever uh, kind of compartment, and we initialize these, these, so these are a ratio, and so they get initialized to a value one. That's just like the fold in this the in induction ratio. So like when so if they're non induced, like the value starts out at one. And then if it's induced up to a value of two, that means it's twice um, it's kind of increased by a factor of two, I think. So remember we went to this uh I can go back here. Uh Right, so we're we're kind of looking at this this ratio, right? So it's it starts at one, which means we're at this baseline, and then it just kind of goes up by a factor of two, a factor of three, um, and this is like the the rate the that induction ratio. Okay, so that's like that's so you can. So so basically, what I want to show here is that you can, you can either. It, it, uh, 
give it a compartment that gets initialized to a value of zero, or you can, in this init block, you can give it a compartment and then just give it a value, this kind of default initialized value. Um, and then this dollar ODE block um, is just the equations. They're just, uh, um, this is for the central compartment, muscle, skin, adipose. I sort of come up with my own naming convention because we have to kind of, there's like, there's KPs, for, there's kind of two kind of KPs for the, like the muscle compartment and things like that because there's two drugs involved. Um, and this is just all, um, uh, Let me come down here to the uh, here. yeah. So the so like you're asking about the what this this kind of ratio is. So there's like a, a a degradation, and then there's this is kind of driven by like an EC fifty, um, and then like an Emax parameter. Um, and then kind of think what what th what this kind of ends up uh, influencing here yeah so I think that that's that ends up so that ratio ends up influencing the um, the intrinsic clearance for the uh, midase lime in the, in the in the liver and you've, and you've got this, like, for all those different five liver compartments. So it's pretty, sim pretty simple. I mean, um, it's a lot of math and symbols to, to keep track of, but, yeah. Uh, in line 307, what does the stopper mean? Uh, yeah. Um, so, so energy solve works in, uh, in C++. Um, and so when you write your model, you're really writing C++ code. And we tried to make it so that you don't really have to know C++ to, to do this. So we tried to make it as little as possible. Um, but one of the things that you have to do when you declare a new variable in C++ is that you have to tell it what type it is. Um, so when we say double here, that means a double precision real valued number. So, um, and it just means it's a floating point number. Uh, so you could do, and almost always when we create new variables, we create them as doubles. You could create a float or something with less precision on it, but just use double. And just, it's kind of hard to get used to at first, but after you do this for a while, you just start writing double in front of everything. Um, if you did want an integer, you could do int. And if you did want like a Boolean value, you could do bool, like for a logical, like true, false. Um, but since we're creating this variable that, that's gonna live in C++, this is a real kind of C++ variable and just put double in front of it. You also notice that in these blocks that uh, the line ends with a semicolon. So that's another kind of gotcha that people have a hard time getting used to that you don't have to do an R. Um, but every line in, in this in the C++ code needs to end with a semicolon. And anything yeah, it's like it's initializing a, a variable. Yeah. And you know what, I thought a little bit about that in the design. Um, like we could have gone through and tried to guess when you created new variables and kind of take care of the typing. But once the model gets at all complex, like I think you'll want to be able to do this to say, well, I'll tell you what these new variables are. And it's just, it just, you'll, it becomes a habit to write this in the, not too bad. Yeah. You could also use like SimSip, like that kind of thing, or? Sure, you could use that too. Yeah, so like we, we, we can't use PKSim because we don't work in a Windows environment. We don't, we, we don't use PKSim because we can't work in a Windows environment. 
and we also want to be able to hook this up to a Shiny app, and we, this can work in any platform that we that we want to use it in. Yeah, you could do that. Yeah. Um, yeah, but you, so where are you gonna export it to though? Sure. Yeah, but I just mean, you know, the concept of having three models, hard coded, that's that's probably going to go across. But if you have a, a software that pretty much can be built around it, with the structure, to, you know, help you uh, the best, to the, to the best of the software to, to uh, help you not, like to guide you in the modeling process to not make mistakes. So, yeah, it's not, it's not the question. So I think, I think, so we kind of take this, like, w the way we think about it is that we want to, like, code the model once. Um, and so, and we want to have all the code kind of out and available for us, for us to look at and for our clients to look at. So, like, everything's kind of, um, we, we kind of like to have just all the code just there and you can look at the math and anybody can see what, what happens. And we can use the same model to do... Um, our parameter estimation and our predictive check and run the shiny app and and all that so it's just coding the model once um, but yeah that's the, the I mean the the I don't know Matt do you have any I mean, so, I mean we're not we're certainly not trying to yeah. bump anything out of the way here it's just it's a, a philosophy of if you want things as transparent as they can be and all the code is here and it, it looks like a lot of typing but as Kyle said, it took me a few hours to do it. It's, it's not a go. Um, it was entirely too, too cumbersome once, once you're into what you're doing. Uh, and then it's all you know, auditable. It's, it's, so there are, there's something to be said for commercial software or, or you know, TK Sim has done very nicely to put it out uh, into, into open fields. Um, but when you can script something, you can go line by line, you can use the teaching, um, you can continue to modify it, you can make it available to the public, other people can embed it, they can use it, they can expand on it. Um, so at this point, we're not saying that this is how we would go into like a regulatory submission with a, with a, a CDPK model. Uh, you know, there's obviously a lot of more work that would need to be done for that. It's more just a philosophy of making it as, again, transparent as it possibly can be. Um, it's definitely not a point and click easy to do thing in, in that respect, but in the other sense, everything, again, is documented. You know exactly what was done and how. Uh, and then you get all the utility of R built on that. And I think that, to me, that's the really cool thing is that you can you can do the, the statistical type summary, you can bring different data in, uh, you can make any kind of plot that you could ever imagine. Um, so again, it's, that, it's using it as a sort of a, a one-stop platform that's attractive to us. We don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm not trying to get into that, but I'm just... Uh, yeah, no, and, and that's, yeah, no, and I, yeah, I, 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 I can talk about that. I mean, I mean, we, yeah, we've just been doing like this since before PK Sim kind of came. Yeah, sure. Yeah, we've been kind of doing this for years, so. Um.
Yeah, it's just a different approach, just different to... Uh... Okay, so that's kind of like, kind of getting into that a little bit and hopefully kind of showed some of the biology around the uh, around the drug-drug interaction. Um, I wonder, Matt, if we should go to the bone model now. Do you want to um, do a quick intro on that? Yeah. Or, uh, so we'll kind of change gears from the PBPK stuff, and uh, um, I guess I can kind of pull up the publication here. Uh, so this is work that came out of uh, Metrum. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, do you want to just introduce it? I mean, yeah. Yeah, and so when we were trying to come up with examples of showing different, like, dosing regimens and, and all that, and then um, other ways to be able to, to use models like this and, and Kyle mentioned briefly at the beginning that we've actually taken this model and built it into an R package and so Kyle kind of give a, a demo of that but um, the reason that we're showing this is because we had a, a model that we had developed uh, and what we wanted to do is extend the model and part of extending that model was we had this model that uh, described changes in bone markers over time uh, through the actions of denosumab. And the idea was to then sort of do a, a, a middle out approach where we then took the changes in bone markers and described changes in bone mineral density. And uh, it was fairly simple to do uh, given that we already had the um, the model and uh, we don't have the anyway if the, you've probably all seen the diagram of the bone model with the, the organs and all that so we just took the bone markers and added a differential equation essentially uh, we did some some fitting of that uh, and predicted out what the bone mineral density change would be over time as a function of changes in uh, bone uh, specific ALK-FOS and the serum CTX uh, and Oh, here's the little cartoon. Um, so we had all these pieces in here, and we had descriptions in the bone, and, and again, of the bone markers. And so we were really just taking that and expanding it out uh, to describe uh, changes in, uh, in BMD. Um, the interesting thing, I think, for this context right here is that Amgen did a crazy huge phase two study uh, when they were developing denosumab, where they had a placebo group, they had uh, dose ranging uh, with doses uh, given every three months, uh, doses given every six months, uh, and then they had some that uh, went for a period of time and stopped and switched over. Uh, and so we thought this would be a cool example to show how you can go in and, and use all of the, you know, dosing changes that, that we had um, uh, we had shown earlier on and they also reported all the lumbar spine data uh, the changes in uh, the CTX and the, and the bone elk FOS so we were able to uh, <laughs> predict all that stuff um, so this was all done again in the Berkeley Madonna and so what we've done is sort of brought this into um, uh, into MRG solve and, and sort of recreated um, the, the figures from uh, from the publication. And so I think that's a cool thing is that when you have uh, publications like CPT PSP that require you to use to, to give the model, you can actually then go back in, pull that execu executable model up, and create the code that you need to actually reproduce exactly what the, and it gives you a sense that, yeah, the model is running exactly as uh, the authors um, had intended. Here, we were the authors, so we, we were pretty hopeful that that, that was the case, and it, it was, so. Um, so anyway, so there were uh, different changes from all these different dosing regimens. Again, here you have, uh, um, you know, a dose given, there's a discontinuation, and then 
uh, initiation of a, a, another, I think they switched over to a 60 milligram uh, dose later on. Uh, we were able to describe the off treatment effects, so a rebound um, above baseline. And just kind of an interesting story here about when we were developing this model, um, Amgen at the point had never actually gone off treatment with denosumab. And uh, they were collecting data, and we were actually getting the real live clinical trial data at the time. And they said, hey, what's going to happen when we get this next set of data in? And we said, oh, the, everything's going to come back and it's going to rebound above baseline. And they, they were like, no, 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 we don't want to hear that. And, and you can't make the model predict that. We're like, well, that's what it's predicting. And then they get the data, and, and sure enough, it, it came back up. And, but we said, don't worry, it's going to come up, but then it's going to you know, gradually decline back to, uh, to baseline. And that made me feel a little better. They got the data, and they looked at us, and they said, how did you know that was going to happen? So it was kind of cool to um, get a little bit of uh, you know, credibility from, from that sense. But um, so anyway, we developed the model. We've now got it into uh, MRG Solve. It runs super fast now, and we can put variances and, and everything else on it. Um, we took those changes in uh, bone markers and predicted out then from that added differential equation uh, what the changes in lumbar spine BMD would be from the different, uh, different types of dosing regimens. Uh, the other cool thing, and this is like a systems biology thing, is that you can also predict out things that you can't necessarily measure. So a lot of this model and the feedback mechanisms are based on changes in this TGF beta within the bone. And there's actually a, an inactive form that's activated by osteoclast to an active TGF beta. So you can actually then make predictions of what you think those really unmeasurable. I'm sure that you know somewhere in some lab you could go and measure it, but not in a real world sort of clinical setting. And so you can look at what the time courses of those other parts of the model are uh, to help you understand why some of the rebounds are occurring. And what we were saying there is that that rebound was actually occurring. It goes back to like a Bill Jesko, um, you know, precursor pool type model is that uh, you were blocking this, the, the precursor pool was building up, and then as soon as you let go of it, you know, there was a, a rebound, which again, it's to us, it makes perfect sense. To the clinicians at the time, they're like, whoa, no, we don't want to see that. Um, but again, once that precursor pool has sort of built through, when you let go of it, then things come back to baseline. So we're able to, to look at things like that. Um, so I think that's that. And then there's code, too, right, yep. for that? Do you want to run through the code sure, bar? Yeah, All right. Send it back to Kyle. Yeah, so I, th I thought I would just, um, for this, just, um, just there's that kind of key set, series of figures um, in the publication that I thought I'd just recreate by simulation. Um, and there's just another important thing that I, we wanted to show um, is just how to get this model. So there's the, the model isn't in the repository, um, but we're going to show you how to install it and kind of get, well, you can get the code out um, in kind of a unique way. Um, and this is just how we um, uh, decided to kind of distribute this model. Um, so again, as Matt said, we're kind of interested in lumbar spine BMD, um, and that's kind of, uh, this kind of bone is kind of constantly re being remodeled and constantly being turned over. So we've got osteoclasts that are breaking down bone and osteoblasts that are building it back up, and this bone is kind of constantly re remodeling. And if you can get the osteoclast to work a little bit less than the osteoblast, you'll kind of end up building bone, and the BMD might go, the bone, bone mineral density might go up. And so we've got kind of three actors here. We've got osteoclasts, um, and that's kind of that's um, uh, that the, the marker for that is this is CTX we call it, and then for the osteoblast it's um, um, BSAP or the um, the the urinary the 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 NTX. Um, so we'll we'll kind of look at those different bone markers, the the kind of differential changes in the bone markers, and then how that translates into the the changes in BMD for the different dosing regimens. Um, in this vignette, I'm going to do this library called Open Bone Men, and, and we're going to install. I'll, I'm going to st install it at the bottom of this vignette, and I'll show you how to get it. Um, and that's just the that's just the model. Um, and this function exposes a, or this package is, exposes a function called Bone Min, that's for bone and mineral. Um, and that just gets low. That just kind of runs the same type of code that we've been running, but under the hood. Oops. Um, and so now we've got um, 
in this uh, model, we've got um, 43 compartments and 153 parameters um, for it. Um, and the code's kind of all over the place, but it's all kind of, we'll, we'll kind of see we can just simulate this uh, from this just as easily as we can from the other models. Um, this is just some formatting stuff for the plots that we'll make. Um, we'll do, um, so we're doing denosumab dosing. Um, it's kind of every, either every three months or every six months. And so what I did is I just made a little uh, numeric variable that how long I wanted a month to be. So I could dose for six months by just saying six times month. Um, the model's kind of parameterized in terms of time, um, but we tend to look at things across like 36 months or something like that, or, or 10 years for some of these. Um, so the time units kind of gets a little bit challenging on this, um, but we've always found a way to kind of handle it. Um, so there's that kind of 60 milligrams every six month uh, uh, regimen. Um, there's a 14 milligram every six months times four, then 60 milligrams every six months times four. Again, this is why we kind of built this stuff that we can kind of put this together easily. So I'm going to take that first event object, I'm going to change the dose to 14, and then I'm going to do additional three for a total of four. Then there's this then operator, so it says first do this and then do this. Um, so then switch back to the 60 milligrams every six months for a total of four. And that's what this, uh, did we do that E2 yet? I think so. So that's what this one is. Um, and we just don't have to do a lot of that math or kind of bookkeeping to figure out when that is. Another regimen was 30 milligrams every three months for eight doses and then back to 60 milligrams every six starting on month 36. So we can put this together with just with those little operations. So we do the 30 milligram dose um, um, and then we do uh, kind of change that and then put that into a sequence um, just to get it to start at the right time. Um, so here's that uh, three milligrams uh, uh, every three every three months for eight doses, and then at the right time switch over to the 60. And then the last one is just 210. That was the easiest one. Just 210 milligrams every six months times four, and then discontinue. Um, we saw this before. This as data set a bit where you can just take all those events and just say um, just combine it into one. And that just lets us go into the, uh, the model once. So we can send all this into the model, say simulate everything that we need, um, just do it in one time, and we kind of kind of combine this all together into a single data object. Um, and the, just run the simulation. Um, so, the, um, so this is, a, so this is our, our osteoclasts. So our CTX marker, and we expressed it as a change from baseline for all the different dosing regimens here. Um, it's just a, a kind of a big call to ggplot just to try and recreate this figure. Um, and you, so you can see that as you dose this denosumab, the uh, osteoclasts um, are decreased. Um, we can take that same object and uh, 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 simulate with the osteoblasts, um, and you can see, and I know Mac, you can, uh, so the, so the, both the osteoclasts and the osteoblasts go down, um, but we're looking at this kind of differential change, right, so that the osteoclasts kind of, simply like the osteoclasts go down more than the osteoblasts. Yeah, so yeah, I probably should have explained that. So yeah. the drug itself uh, causes uh, a blockade that, that results in the osteoclast dying, and also the, the, the differentiation Mm -hmm. uh, and so when they die off, and this is, yeah, I only half explained the CGF beta piece, it, it's those osteoclasts that activate CGF beta, and so when they die off, mm -hmm. there's less activation of CGF beta, and that CGF beta is also involved in uh, osteoblast differentiation. I see. And so it, it's one of these feedback mechanisms that's supposed to keep the two in balance. Right. I, I always think of it in a really probably too root crude of yeah. a, a road paving type scenario where the osteoblasts are out front and they're like the reclaimer chewing up the road and then the blasts follow behind and lay down new um, new bone matrix. And 
so there's that requirement of coupling between the osteoblast and the osteoclast that once it's broken, the osteoclasts die off, and that's to keep the osteoclast from trying to get too far out ahead yep. and chewing up too much road uh, without the osteoblast being able to follow behind and, and fill in the, the pavement behind them. So you can't just totally bl block this. You got to keep some kind of semblance of connection right, yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, it's just that natural balance yeah. that's been built in, into the system, and we're breaking that in a little way. And then the sclerosin inhibitors do it even completely differently. But yeah. So anyway, that's that's why they both go down, but there's a delay in time for when the osteoblast comes. Yep. Um, and then just taking the same data, and we're just again we're just plotting different kind of compartments in the data set to get the, the lumbar spine uh, BMD uh, changed from baseline um, for the different dosing regimen, regimens. Um, and I think this is, is this, uh, was this approved at the 60? 60, 60 milligrams. Every six, yep. every, yeah, twice a year, yeah. And then, um, then again, it's just uh, uh, more plotting code to get that uh, TGF beta uh, profiles. Um, one's the um, the active, and then one's the, the latent TGF beta. So again, it's just simulating from the model. Again, it's just a matter of uh, it's really just putting together these dosing regimens um, to get the right intervention that you want, and then you can simulate into these profiles. Um, so kind of a simple uh, illustration of just using the bone model. Um, we put the um, or Metrum put the um, this bone model up on GitHub. Um, and so just the same way as you went to Metron Research Group uh, slash Emergy Solve, um, you can just go to Metron Research Group slash Open Bone Men, and that's our open bone um, and mineral model, homeostasis model. And so that just uh, downloads. Um, oh, rats. OK, sorry. This is going to ask for a new RCPV. Shoot. Um, and so like this, this, this function just goes and, uh, like all this does is it's, it's just going to goes, uh, into mRead cache and it just reads the model in just the same way that we've been doing before. Um, with the other models, um, we put, we put some helper functions in there. Um, uh, so that there's like a couple of, uh, scenarios that you can kind of simulate right out, out of the box. So we, um, so our Matt, I guess Matt and Mark, uh, did a lot of the ter teratide modeling in the in the with the model too, um, so we put in a little function that'll just simulate out um, some teratide doses, um, and we can kind of plot those outputs to look at. Uh, so this is the PTH compartment um, for a 20 mi a microgram dose and a 40 microgram dose, um, and then um, we can we can also look at the calcium uh, uh, as you kind of administer the uh, Teraparatide, you get some uh, the calcium elevations as well for both the 20 and the 40 microgram dose. Um, you can just sim out, simulate out this denosumab example um, across a bunch of different doses, and this will give you that uh, denosumab uh, concentra concentration time profile um, with a with a nonlinear kinetics there, um, and then you can just go in and just plot out that uh, uh, lumbar spine BMD uh, as well. Under those uh, those kind of more s simplified uh, denosumab profiles. Um, and then I'll just go to this. Uh, here's that Open Bone Men uh, repository, and then. Um, you can get this. This uh, the, the model is just sitting right here, and that's what gets pulled down in that R package. And this is uh, almost 800 lines of code to get all that stuff in there. So it's uh, when when you dig into this, it just kind of takes your breath away to 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 deal with all the equations. But it all fits together, and it all kind of it all kind of works somehow. So. So any other questions on that one? Um, 
I think we'll do just maybe just kind of one more vignette on the on the ERK uh, inhibition because it just shows a nice uh, clinical trial simulation from a virtual patient. So I think it'll be a little bit different workflow than what we've been looking at so far. Um, and the oops. So this came out, um, the Genetech group published this um, and just had just a ton of stuff in there. So we just kind of was really happy to see this come out. Um, they're looking at ERK inhibition in this BRAF mutant colorectal cancer. Um, and this is just this kind of monster paper with just, I mean, it's so, it's just such a, it's so dense and there's just so much work that went into it. So it's, it was fun to study. but. Just getting up here and talking about all of it um, is a little bit overwhelming, but so I'll try and just kind of summarize some of the the key points that's going to be relevant to the simulations that we're going to be talking about. So um, this model is looking at um, this BRAF mutation, um, and they're looking at it in colorectal cancer, and they're looking at treatments that worked for the same mutation, um, but in a mel mel melanoma, where the the treatments that they were looking at were um, more effective than what they were seeing in the in the colorectal can colorectal cancer, um, and so this is like the, the signaling diagram of this kind of map, this sort of map kinase signaling pathway down the center here, um, with EGFR and this RAS and CRAF and BRAF. Um, there's mech in, no, there's a MEK inhibitor, um, and then an ERK inhibitor, and so there's this kind of central path here. Um, the white signaling pathway is like sort of like their alternate pathway. So one of the things that they're interested in is like as they inhibit at different points in this pathway, so we're looking at combination therapies, and as they in inhibit this, uh, this kind of central pathway, could some of the signaling still come in through this alternate pathway and then, and then just end ending up stimulating uh, tumor growth down here in, in green? Um, and then there's this kind of feedback cycle here that I didn't really get into, um, but that's in the model. That's in the model as well. Um, and um, so the so just to go back to the uh, sorry. so just to go back to the to the vignette. Um, so again, there. Um, so this BRAF mutation just uh, it's, it results in constitutively active BRAF uh, with subsequent signaling through MEK and ERK. Um, and so they found that these uh, BRAF inhibitors and these MEK inhibitors were effective in this melanoma, but really not very effective at all in colorectal cancer. And so they're trying to figure out why this might be through this for this through this mechanistic modeling. Um, they wondered if this resistance could be uh, mediated through EGFR signaling through this RAS and CRAF pathway. So um, could it could be EG, EGFR through RAS, then CRAF and kind of getting around where that, where that BRAF inhibitor might not be uh, effective. Um, and then they're also wondering, so the, the whole kind of point of the paper is that they're looking at to see what would happen if they inhibited at the level of ERK. Um, so what if we added in um, an inhibitor down here at ERK um, could that work kind of on its own or in combination with other uh, 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 regimens or with other uh, therapeutics uh, or other me mechanisms of action, I guess. So our cast of characters, I always have a hard time kind of keeping all these straight. But there's a BRAF inhibitor, um, famurafenib, a MEK inhibitor, MEK inhibitor cobimetinib, cetuximab, this is, is that EGFR antibody, and then the one that they're kind of in development here is this, this GDC0994, um, which is this ERK inhibitor. So that's sort of like the star of our show, that they're really trying to figure out if they can, if this is going to be helpful in this uh, BRAF mutant colorectal cancer. Um, so just a little bit about the translation and how the model was. So the, 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 the model was published as SBML code. Um, and um, Dan, the, the lead author, he said that they were working with it in um, Symbiology, um, and he says, "Oh yeah, we, we came to uh, uh, publish the model, and we just I just kind of hit the export button, and just kind of whatever came out, I sent up. Um, 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 but we but what we did is we wrote um, so there's uh, 
our bindings to this libsbml, which is a SBML library that will read SBML code. And so we wrote a little translator that would go into the SBML and convert this into MRG solve. And this is the second model that we've taken out as or QSP large QSP model that we've taken out as SBML. And there's we found a place for everything so far in the MRG solve format. Um, and so I'd say like the the we already had the translator and I had to it was maybe 90% of the way there. There's a little bit of an art to writing SBML, I think. Um, and that, you know, stuff might always always be in the same place where you think it's going to be. And so it just, uh, you know, it took me about a half hour to tweak it, the translator to get it to work um, with this model as well. And everything seemed like it worked great. So um, it was really nice to have, and it made the translation really easy um, to do to, to be able to script that. So, um, so as I said, there's just a ton of work in here. Um, cause some of the, some of it's kind of like a lot of kind of the preclinical stuff, modeling and simulation that they did. And I was looking for a figure to kind of go after. I mean, it's just way, way too much for us to, to, to even do, but if you kind of come all the way down, um, in the paper, um, they kind of come to this figure that, I, oop, where is it? This figure that I thought was pretty good. So what we're going to do with the simulation today is that, um, I'm going to try and recreate this figure 6B. So um, 6A, we've got the PK of the different agents for the different kind of cast of characters here. So just uh, simulating out like I think 12 hours of their PK there. Um, and we're going to try and simulate that PK um, and we're going to um, try and simulate out all combinations of these four drugs. So we're going to do all, mono, all four monotherapy, all the doublet therapy, all the triplet, and then, the, then all four uh, regimens. Um, and as I said, the authors kind of gave us this data, this CSV file of the virtual patients that they used to simulate this out. So we had, so the, the dots here are simulations that came from the virtual population. So we had those. Um, and they're just kind of plotting tumor size at uh, uh, two months, I think. Um, and so these points are this kind of distribution of tumor sizes for all the, for no therapy at all, then all the monotherapies, then the doublets. Um, and what they had is they had these points in red where, uh, so the gray points are all just totally simulated, and then the red points were actual data that they had collected. Um, and they kind of made this point that we kind of simulate out, when we simulate out, um, our simulations look like the where, the, where we do have red points, the simulations look like that. Um, and so that uh, gave us some confidence that, that gave them some confidence that the model was doing fairly well, and then they might start to look at where, where don't we have red points and, can, and we might be able to put some stock into those uh, predictions that they're making because they really want to get at um, uh, this GDC compound, which I can't, I don't think they had uh, observations in there. Maybe they did here. Um, so I'm going to try and just recreate this, uh, recreate this figure. Um, and it just shows like a little bit different workflow um, from a simulation perspective. So this is in the file called MAP, MAP kinase inhibitors in colorectal cancer. Um, okay, um, so do our MRG solve package. Let's pull this up. Load the tidyverse. Um, if you're running this on um, if you're running this on Windows, I'm going to use this parallel package. Um, so if you're running on a, a Unix-based system, you can parallelize these simulations pretty easily. Um, uh, and that's just kind of built into R. Um, on Windows computers, you can't do that because Windows just is a limitation of the operating system. Um, and so if you're on Windows, um, you can just do this. So I'm going to use a function called mcl-apply, and that's multi-core l-apply, and that's going to parallelize the simulation that we're going to do. This is going to be much more intensive than the one we've been doing. You don't have that on Windows, but you can just map that to l-apply, and it'll functionally do the same thing. So um, just to create a function called mcl-apply, it's just l-apply, and that's really all that this is. Um, I'm going to load in that virtual patient, or the, the virtual uh, population. Um, that's going to have 250 patients in it. And there's, you can see there's 147 columns. And uh, 
this just gets a lot to be a, uh, to, to deal with. So what we have in the setup is that the, the column names are the names of the parameters in the model. So remember, we had parameters and um, we had compartments. And so for every compartment and for every parameter in the model, we've got one column in this data frame. And so I can just head this. It's just kind of a lot of data to deal with, but for every virtual patient, they've got an initial value for each of the compartments, and then they've got a value for all the parameters. And so that variability in those parameters, I think, is where the variability in those simulations are going to come from. And we've also got, um, you can maybe see a little bit down here, that we've also got um, variability in the, in the PK parameters as well that I simulated in. It's just a lot to deal with, so it's kind of hard to, to show that very clearly. Um, but we can read that model in the same way we do. Um, and I'm just going to immediately update because I want to do that two month simulation. So I'm going to have the simulation head at 56 days. Um, and then, um, like if you do use this model, um, maybe this is one of the kind of gotchas of the export. So if you look at the parameters just coming out of the model, and this is what was in the SBML, like all the parameters are like ones and zeros. So that maybe that was some problem with the export. And so when I use this model, um, I probably should just go in and just fill in like the nominal values for the, all the parameters. But what I'm gonna do here is I'm just gonna take, I'm gonna slice off one of the people from the virtual population. I'm just gonna fill in that person's parameters. Um, so that now when I do the, 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 look at the model parameters, now I've got like realistic, like real values in there, but it's just really just one person out of that virtual population. Um, so if you don't, if you, I always forget to do that, and then I'd like the simulations come out like totally wacky, of course. I'm like, oh, what happened? Um, so just fill that in, and I thought we'd just do like some uh, example simulations where we can just, um, so this is kind of like this multi-dose uh, data frame that we came up with, so we've got, um, Six rows. Um, I think the so this is so we're looking at the ERK inhibitor, um, that GDC 0994. Um, they were dosing it at 400 milligrams um, once a daily, and this is the one that was uh, three weeks on then one week off. So we have to simulate that cycle, right? We, then we want to do two of those cycles, and so I'm just gonna take this data frame. I'm gonna simulate out out to 600 milligrams just to see what happens by 100 milligrams. Um, the dose goes into compartment 12. Um, and then we're going to, because the model's in days, so this is your question, um, the interdose interval is one. So we want one dose a day. And so it's kind of up to us to keep track of that. And then we're going to do additional uh, 20 doses. So we're going to do this three-week cycle here. And that's what this is. And then I can take that sequence function, and I can just say, we'll do that sequence, then wait for seven days, and then do that sequence again. Um, and... Uh, when you look at at the end, no. So now, like each person has kind of a two dose, uh, two dosing uh, kind of segments here. So the first three weeks, and then after a seven day waiting period, there's this the second three weeks. Um, and we kind of put the, again, we put this all, all together because we can just fire this off as a single simulation. And so this is the uh, the ERG inhibitor PK on the left, and you can see this the cycling on this little break uh, here for the week in the middle. And then another cycle, another part of the cycle there, and then these are the changes in tumor. So um, like the the previous one, they just start the tumor in one, and really they're looking to see if there's like you know a thirty percent decrease in the tumor uh, size after a certain period of time, and so we can just kind of read this directly off the the plot here, for like this is so this is kind of like doing that dose response on that that, that tumor kinetics over time, and this is the the, the PK here on the left. <laughs> Um, they kind of make a big deal about the doing the sensitivity analysis. So they did sensitivity analysis on the on the model parameters, and they found that there there are two <laughs> parameters that were kind of particularly important in determining uh, these the response rate was so whether somebody had this uh, uh, this uh, objective response or not. Um, one was this is called WOR, um, and that's that MAP kinase pathway dependence parameter. Um, and so what that does is that um, flipping back to the, um, so what that does, so right, so there's like this map, there's a, there's a, there's this kind of central map kinase um, pathway going down to tumor growth, 
and then there's like this extra uh, kind of pathway coming down here and um, and so like the tumor could be heavily dependent upon signaling through this mechanism or it could not be that dependent it could the tumor could be growing through this kind of pathway as well and the, that mat, then that dependence parameter just says like what fraction of the signaling is through the gray that central gray box um, and so that those parameters are between um, zero and one so one means you're totally dependent on that central pathway and then zero means you're totally not um, and if you look at um, and so yeah so uh, I'll say so and then the other parameter that they found was very influential was this uh, maximal cell death rate for the for the tumor so this tumor is kind of proliferating and then there's a death rate for that tumor and like the the, the there's, there's a maximum death rate for that and that was very influential for uh, achieving this uh, response and so if you look at the just looking at the quartiles of this for this WOR so this is that map kinase dependence parameter um, you can see this runs from a lot, a lot of people are like 100 percent dependent on this pathway um, but as you look down the quantile so this is the 90th percentile um, and then this is like I guess this is the minimum and then this is the 10th percentile so the 10th percentile is like 82 percent through there so almost everybody in here are um, at least 80 percent like kind of dependent on that map kinase pathway but there's a lot of people that are um, extremely dependent on it so greater than 90 percent or 95 I mean, I don't know what the cutoff for extremely de dependence is, but we'll see what that what that does to the to the to the kinetics there. Um, so we'll just do like a quick um, simulation here with this. Uh, so there's just just the 400 milligram dose for the ERK inhibitor. Um, uh, so um, this is using this, um, and so this is that sensitivity analysis. Um, so this purple he down here. At the very bottom, that's 100% dependence on MAP kinase pathway, and then this red bar at the top, that's 90% uh, dependence on the MAP kinase. So some of this is kind of conditional on all the other parameters in the model, but you can see that if you're if you're up to 90% de dependent on the MAP kinase signaling pathway, like the tumor is actually growing under therapy and it's not shrinking. Um, and in order to get some kind of net growth, I mean you got to be at least 96% dependent on uh, on that map kind of uh, signaling pathway so it kind of shows you like how much for this ERK inhibitor you really need to be dependent on that on that central pathway um, to um, to do the simulation so uh, um, we could have done this kind of manually where we could have made this matrix of parameters and simulated this out um, I'm using that MRG uh, solve TK package um, where we just kind of took this uh, we made this function we kind of wrap this sensitivity analysis around um, that simulation where we can say I want to do a sensitivity analysis on the range of this parameter and I want it to go to from 0.9 to 1 and just give me eight values in between those um, points and it just works right into our workflow so I can take our model I can do this event object I can request uh, an output and then I can say just do sensitivity analysis give me eight points between 90 percent and 100 percent and then just the rest of it's just just making the plot and so that's kind of the idea behind this 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 toolkit package to say okay do some of that work that we kind of routinely do um, under the hood so that you can just fire this simulation out very quick um, so that's just a little bit of sensitivity analysis there's other stuff like you can do like a normal distribution with 30 percent cv or you can do a uniform distribution and that kind of stuff um, so that's that emergy self tk package um, it's just on two of these uh, uh, chunks here this is that same uh, sensitivity analysis on the uh, on that maximum death rate here I did uh, um, I just said take the parameter and multiply it by 2 and then divide it or then multiply it by 0.2 and do a, a range in between there it's a little bit harder to tell what kind of what the sensitivity is here but uh, uh, that's just kind of our just trying to investigate what they were doing there Yeah, so th so that um, I got a vignette on that, so it'll do that Sobol uh, sensitivity analysis, and that's um, yeah. So that's something that I just I pull in another package to get that done. And I can show you that too. Yeah. So the, yeah, this is just kind of like the simplistic stuff that I just this workflow that we sometimes do that I could easily wrap up and and that kind of thing. So um, so we kind of like did a little bit of sensitivity analysis. We looked at the PK and the PD, 
Now we just want to try and recreate that, do that population simulation. Um, and so I'm just going to take this, this is a little bit of a brute force, um, but a little bit now, and I'm going to show you my strategy here. So I'm going to generate my dosing regimens. Um, and the first thing I do is just no treatment. Um, I think I just had to trick it to do that. I, I, I'm not sure it just kind of naturally will just say, just do no treatment. So I just, I just did amount of zero into compartment eight. And so that just should be the same as no treatment. Uh, here's the BRAF inhibitor. Um, and we'll get into the details of the dosing. Uh, but data zero is going to be no treatment. Data V is a vimurafenib. That's uh, the BRAF inhibitor. Um, the ERK inhibitor, we kind of did this before, right? We did the seven days on, uh, one, uh, sorry, seven, uh, three weeks on, seven days off. Um, and that's going to be data G. And that's what this looks like. This um, looks kind of funny because we're just getting the troughs here. And we can just uh, do a delta. Then we can then we can see the the kind of peaks and troughs there. Um, the MEK inhibitor, cobimetinib, the EGFR inhibitor, the cetuximab. Okay, so like uh, so I got so I got all my monotherapy regimens kind of coded out, so I can do all the monotherapy. But I need to do all the the dual therapies. I need to do all the triplet therapies. Then all four of them together. So this is what I'm going to do. So I made a little function that's just going to combine, it's called COM, and it's going to combine all these regimens into a single regimen, just the same way we've been combining them right before, right? We were just kind of putting these two together and just say, do all these. Um, so I'm just going to make an R function out of there. Um, and then there's another R function called SIM, and SIM is just going to take in a, it's going to take in a data set, it's going to take the virtual patients, it's going to take the model object, and it's just going to do uh, the, uh, our regular workflow. It's going to take the model, do the events, and it's going to simulate from that virtual population. So there's a, there's other function called sim that we use in a minute. Um, so just for example, so this combine function um, will combine um, this one and this one. So we've got these two uh, doses starting at time zero, and they go out to the full regimen. So this is that double doublet combination. And then I can just take that from that simulate sim function. I can just take that simulation sim function. I can pass in that combined regimen, pass in the here. I just did ten of the peop, the patients and pass in the mod. So it's easy enough to write these little helper functions that automate your workflow. Um, and so now I'm going to take this. This is where it gets a little bit brute force. Where I'm just going to go through. I'm going to list all the combinations that I want to do. <laughs> and I'm going to make a. It's, it's called a, it's a, I'm going to make one data frame that's got, here's the treatment and here's all the, here's the combination that we're going to, we want to treat. Um, and if you look at the head of this thing, so this looks kind of like a funny data frame, but it's got two columns in it. This label is a character and that's the, the label of the treatment. And then this other column contains the dosing regimen that's all kind of packaged up and it's called a list call. And that's a data frame that's embedded in a, in a data frame, basically. Um, and I can just run the simulation um, where we're going to simulate, and I'm just going to mutate this uh, sims thing that I just created. And I'm going to make a new column called the output, and that's just going to um, apply across that object column. It's going to call sim, and it's going to pass in all my other arguments. Um, uh, and get it done. So this is kind of working right now. I hope I didn't write. I hope I didn't overwrite that. That no, I, it shouldn't be. So I'm going into this parallel package to call this MCL apply. So it's doing this uh, parallelized. There you go. So, um, so the nice thing about using these these kind of list calls is that now I've got a data frame and I've still got one row for every intervention that I did, but I've got the the in, the input uh, dosing data frame in this column, and then I've got the output here, um, and so I can just take this and I can select, um, I can go into that data frame, I can select the label and the output, and now I've got. Oops, SMS. 
So now I've got all the simulations that I needed to get done um, in this big um, in this one big data frame. Um, and then um, this just gets it ready for the plot. Uh, And so there's that there's the the figure that they made in the in the in the paper or yeah that they made in the paper, um, and I little, I did a little bit more work here than maybe I needed to like I could have programmed some of that, but I wanted to get the treatments in the same order that they published them so I could just check and just to see yep like these boxes seem like they're they're more or less falling into what they were reporting in the paper and it gave me some confidence in the model again. Um, um, in the paper. Um, so they put they had the red points where the observed uh, responses that they saw like in a, in a clinical trial um, uh, and I don't have those data put on there but they make a point that they're um, that out of all these simulations that that the ERK inhibitor was the most effective monotherapy that they tried and this it was the ERK and the cobimetinib um, that were that was the most effective uh, dual therapy that they tried. And so what I did in the plot is I just colored the, the boxes here red for any regimen that had the ERK inhibitor here. So there, here's the just the GDC components, just the ERK inhibitor as monotherapy. And this box, this cobimetinib and the, and the ERK inhibitor is this one right here. And they kind of made this point that they were, that was the most uh, uh, effective like monotherapy and double therapy. And if you look at the double, like the double's like kind of looking pretty good against a lot of the triplet therapies too and, you, and um, maybe a little bit less effective than the all four but like that du that dual therapy is kind of looking kind of good in terms of all these combinations here. Um, so they started looking into this ERK inhibitor um, with or without the, the cobimetinib um, and kind of going back to that uh, going back to that um, point that the, the sensitivity in that analysis that we made on the MAP kinase dependence. So they said okay we know that the people that respond are kind of heavily dependent on this MAP kinase signaling pathway. So what if we could come up with some kind of bio, some diagnostic test or some biomarker that would indicate um, people that have tumors that are heavily dependent on this MAP kinase signaling, we can enrich our trial to try and select these people and we're going to see higher response rates. Um, and so they did a simulation that I did as well too, um, uh, where we're, so we're looking at this uh, overall response rate. Um, where we just kind of take the uh, the different treatments and we're looking at the the people that had a a, a tumor less than 0.7 and that means they had a 30 percent decrease in the tumor size. Um, and so for the you can so this is the just the overall population. And you can see for this monotherapy it was 14 percent for the ERK inhibitor and then the the ERK um, plus the Kobe cobimetinib it was only 35 percent. And they were getting something like over 70% for the melanoma for these, for these, uh, these kind of dual uh, therapies. And so they said, well, this is kind of miserable. Um, so what if we select patients that are, are only, uh, they've got this kind of MAP kinase dependence greater than the median MAP kinase dependence. So these are the people, the upper half of that distribution. And so um, kind of, I think this is what they did. Um, this is what I did anyway. Um, so I took that virtual patients and I said, okay, the this uh, WR parameter, so this MAP kinase dependence parameter, is only only keep the ones that are greater than the median. This is called VP select, and we got um, hope we got so we got 122 there, um, and so I can rerun my the simulation with that uh, not that whole virtual population, only these ones. These people that are uh, highly dependent on the the map kinase signaling, um, and when you when you do that, um, now we've got uh, twenty percent, twenty nine percent with the monotherapy for the ERK inhibitor, and then we've got seventy percent with the uh, with the GDC plus the cobimetinib. And so they then they kind of that's sort of like the where they end up in the paper, and they say, well, this might be this might be promising. This might be uh, um, that seventy percent is kind of comparable to what they were getting in the melanoma, so they thought, well, if we could find some way to enrich our population to be these people that are heavily dependent on MAP kinase, then that might be a way to go forward to, um, to find a population that's going to respond. Um, 
So, um, and I think they, they report some numbers, and I think these are these are kind of close to what they report, but they're not exactly they're off by like three or four percent or something like that. So maybe there's some slight difference in the way they did it, but I just sort of read what they did and tried to replicate it. I thought we came, came pretty close. Um, yeah, so that's the the ergon inhibition vignette. Um, Oh yeah, yeah. Um, so, um, so we, um, where is it? Uh, it's. Uh, oh, shiny here. So we took this model and we just. Uh, did a really kind of brief shiny app uh, behind it. Um, it's kind of simple, but it kind of touches on a little bit of the things that we did in the in the, in the vignette. Um, so here's this kind of simple simulation scenario where we looking at this. Um, this this is the ERK inhibitor, the PK, and then the the tumor. And we can just kind of flip around different doses here, um, and just kind of look at different doses and what we we. we we can expect for a PK and for the uh, uh, tumor dynamics. Um, kind of a simple like sensitivity analysis. This is that map kinase dependence dependence parameter. Um, and uh, so like the uh, yeah so the, the the legend here is sort of like the the solid line is the the um, it's the reference value, but I'm not sure if we used the 100 percent there or not. I can't remember. But this is like that. The nominal value, and then this dashed line, is what happens when you kind of change from that nominal value um, using the slider here. And again, it's just sort of um, as soon as you get sub kind of 94, 95, um, the tumor is kind of growing and not shrinking. And then this last little piece here is um, just simulating a bunch of doses out. Um, I don't know if this is paralyzed or not, but. Um, this is just simulating uh, kind of a placebo dose or just zero dose and then a 200 milligram and then a 800 milligram um, and just to see where these tumor size. Um, so we could kind of wrap that same model that we're using in a shiny app and let, you know, decision makers or clinicians or anybody kind of interact with the model in that way. So. So any other questions or comments on the vignette? Um, yeah, so um, I don't know, should we do, I could show the global sensitivity analysis or we could do the parameter estimation. Is anybody interested in seeing either one? Um, you want to see the optimization? Okay. Um, Um, sorry about the just I just gotta do this here um, oops um, So there's a so Emergy Solve uses this RCPP library, and this RCPP is just a, a C++ interface with with R, and uh, they just had a really bad bug in there, so they just released a CRAN and they just put this bad bug into it right before they sent it up, and uh, so I had to go back and I just discovered it this morning, and because like none of the optimization stuff was working, and like oh no what happened, and then I figured out it was RCPP that had a problem, so I just rolled back to a, a RCPP 12:15. Um, otherwise, this won't work. Okay. Um, so, really quick, the so the optimization stuff is uh, it's based on this other a PVPK model um, that I'm just not going to go into, um, but I just want to give you the gist of where we're heading. Um, so they did this PVPK model. They're looking at uh, OATP uh, inhibition. So they're looking at statins. Um, um, getting cleared, and they're looking at uh, kind of co-administration with inhibitors of the OATP uh, transporters, and the, so that the inhibitor is cyclosporin, 
And so it's this, it's this DDI where um, this is what we're going to kind of go after here. So they, they got this PVK model. They're looking at patavastatin, um, uh, PK, and uh, the blue line is just patavastatin alone, and then the red line is patavastatin with uh, cyclosporin. So the cyclosporin is just inhibiting this OATP trans transporter and it's causing an increase in the statin concentration. PBPK model, we're going to do the optimization in this PBPK model. Um, and there's a way to do optimization in R that we follow here. And so like the stuff that I'm going to show you, um, there's a couple of moving parts, but it's really like kind of like the R way to use an optimizer. And I'm hoping that, I'm hoping to kind of convince you that um, the, uh, it's kind of worthwhile to have these moving parts because it's going to give you a lot of flexibility when doing the optimization. Um, uh, so just as a quick um, introduction, so what I did to do this optimization is I took like I took one of these profiles, I can't remember which one, and I just digitized the points. And I said, okay, I'm going to try and optimize the model for these points. So they're not... I think they're mean data and things like that, but they're kind of representative of what's going on. And I just did it as a, it's the best I could do for the, for the example. Um, and so I put that into a data file um, and I can read that in and just plot it out here. And so this is like kind of like our observed data. So in the uh, green, we've got the statin concentration alone. And then in the orange, we've got the statin plus C, the cyclosporin. Um, and that's just digitized from that figure 4A. That's going to be our observed data that we're going to optimize across. Um, I'm going to take uh, this uh, data set. I'm just going to make this dosing data set with two people in it. One uh, is going to have this uh, the cyclosporin dose uh, and then the patavastatin dose in it. And then the second person is just going to have the patavastatin. So that accounts for those two uh, profiles that we had there that we looked at in the observed data. Um, just do a quick simulation here. So we load the model, um, and we're going to do it out to that, f out to 14 days here is where they did it. Just do some data grooming, and this is that simulated um, DDI. So we're just taking the model and we're simulating it um, just based on the parameters that they report in the paper. And I just did a little quick little exploration here. So the patavastatin alone, or the sorry, in the DDI, um, there's almost a fourfold increase in the in the AUC in the DDI compared to the patavastatin alone. Um, they did the, so part of the part of the report that they made was doing a parameter optimization. So that was part of their kind of report. Um, and they uh, they used a weighted uh, least squares objective function. And so we need to come up with a function in R that we can minimize. And so we're just going to take, so we're going to write this quick little function in R that's going to take our observed data, and it's going to take our predicted data, and it's going to take the, uh, the squared weighted deviation, uh, and it's going to add them up, and it, that's going to be what we're going to try and minimize. So um, I think this is what they did. I think they kind of said that they, they just weighted by the observed data. Um, but we could, we could write a... Or, or ordinary least squares objective function, we could write a, a maximum likelihood objective function for this too, but we're just going to follow what they did in the paper. So WSS is just our weighted least squares. Um, and the other function that we that we do that we need to write here um, is I call it pred, um, but this is just going to be a worker function that we're going to um, enlist the help of an optimizer in R, and then the optimizer in R is just going to search the parameter space for us. And as it's looking around the parameter space, it's going to say, what about this set of parameters? And it's going to pass it to this function. So our job in this function is to, is to take that set of parameters in our data set and to simulate from the model and to get predictions from the model given that set of parameters. And so once we get the predictions, we've got our observed data and we've got our predicted data and we're going to calculate our weighted least squares function and we're just going to return the value of it. So the optimizer is just going to repeatedly call this function. It's going to keep on proposing parameters. 
and we're going to keep on telling it how well it's fitting to the data and it's going to push those parameters around until it gets to some stopping criteria right so there's it's not too bad here so we can pass in these parameters i'm going to estimate them on the log domain so the first thing we do is just get them out of the log domain um, we update our model with the parameters so we've seen that before too um, and then just simulate from our data set um, and then we just take uh, in this output there's a cp thing here and we're just going to pass it into our weighted least squares function um, the other thing I built in here is that after we did the op after I did the optimization, I wanted to see like the the predicted uh, over the observed data just to see how well it's going through. So I just put a little flag on here that just says I can call this function, and if pred is equal to true, all it does is it does the simulation and then it just returns the data. So after I get done optimizing, I'm going to take the parameters that are the optimal parameters and I'm going to call this function again, and then just return uh, predicted values so I can see what the, the what the predictions are looking like. So I just wrap that into the, the same function. Um, okay, so we got that. Now we just need some uh, starting estimates. And I do these all in log domain. Um, these are the parameters that they estimated in the paper. So the intrinsic clearance. Um, this is the inhibitor Ki, so the unbound uh, Ki for the inhibitor Ka. There's a transit thing here. I can't remember what that was. Um, but we've got some starting uh, guesses on log scale, um, and this is the way that kind of uh, this you'll see. So we'll see, so we're going to take everything that we have done, and the goal here is I'm going to fit the data by like four or five different optimizers just so you can see how it works. But everything that we've done so far, we're going to use that for every optimizer. Um, and the way optimization works in R is that you usually have some kind of control. So I'm going to say iPrint equals 25. That means just uh, let me know what's happening every 25 iterations. Um, and so we're going to fit this, and we're going to use this. Um, this is from this MinQA package. And this is just a derivative-free uh, optimization. I wish I could tell you all the details about this, but it's the one I like to use. It's kind of like my go-to one. Um, it's kind of fast, um, um, uh, but it seems to be pretty robust. And so we're going to pass in our initial guess. We're going to give it the name of the function to minimize. And then we're going to pass all the stuff through, right? This is all the stuff that we pass through to the to my pred function. And I can just run this here. Oops. So it's going to um, just run through its iteration. So there it's done. And uh, I'll kind of back this out a little bit. And you can see as this as this is iterating. Um, it'll give us a function value, so it's the evaluation number, and then uh, we probably need to make this bigger. Um, yeah, it's just kind of hard to see. Well, I'll just yeah, it just won't go. Um, anyway, there's there's a, the there's a value of the objective function that's getting smaller and smaller with each iteration. Um, um, but we've got our estimates now, and this is fit one. Um, and um, I can say fit one, par, and those are the estimates. And so I'm just going to put some names onto those by naming it according to my initial estimates. So fit one, par. So these are the estimates on the log domain. Um, but I want to keep them on the log domain because I'm going to call that pred function again to get. So I'm going to call it once with the, our final estimates. And then I'm going to call it again with my initial estimate, theta. So that's that df init. And then I'm just going to go grab the observed data out of there. Um, and then when you make the plot, um, this is kind of what happened. Um, so our observed data is in red. Um, our initial estimates got us these dashed lines here. And then after we optimize the parameters, we get that blue solid line. Just to show that we're, we're kind of fitting through the data here for both the patavastatin alone and for the have that and plus the inhibitor and I can get the final value of the objective function was 0.68 then I can get the final estimates on the on the regular scale um, and I'm just gonna blow through the rest of these so there's this built-in optim package so this does a Nelder mead optimization it's almost the exact same call um, and this is where it kind of gets in I like these two this is where it kind of gets interesting 
So this DE Optum package will let you do, um, it's called uh, differential evolution. And it's like, a, it's in the same family as like a genetic algorithm where you start off with this population of parameters and they mutate and they evolve until like this population starts to look more and more, the data that comes out of this population looks more and more and more like your, um, like your observed data. Um, this is a stochastic method, so it's, uh, it's a simulation-based uh, deal. And so we don't give it starting estimates, but we give it upper and lower bounds. So on the log scale, I'm going to go from minus 6 to, to 4. Um, it's got a control thing, too. And then um, I'm just only going to run it for uh, uh, 90 iterations. Um, and we're like right now, we're on 25, so we're a quarter of the way through. So you can see this takes a lot longer um, than, the, than the other one, the, than the MinQA. Uh, one, but it's really nice because you can just kind of throw any problem at this and um, it'll just come up with some parameters for you and, uh, and it, it doesn't kind of say I, oh, I couldn't couldn't minimize or I couldn't get to the end and it'll just keep on going and um, until you tell it to stop um, but thankfully uh, let's see down to the end so I'm just going to do um, just a ton of data assembly here and I want to show you this plot here is that this is what this this is what this was doing? So this is a panel for each one of our parameters, and you can see um, this is the versus the iteration number. So we did 90 iterations, and it kind of made this population. We're spanning like uh, three orders of magnitude for the parameters, and it's searching around, and it's kind of each iteration. It's got a different population, and this orange line is like the best member of that iteration in the population. And you can see it kind of searches around a little bit, and then eventually it starts to close in, and then we know it's done because it's just really it's, everybody's kind of right in this kind of zone here where it's sort of like a convergent deal. Um, but you can see what a huge part of the parameter space we're searching for all these. Um, and it just doesn't, it doesn't, it just, it's not a bother. Um, and so this is a real kind of global type uh, search algorithm. Yeah, so how does it compare to non-mem? Um, yeah, or something like that. Um, I mean, this one is like kind of not really that sensitive because it just, uh, it's, it, it's just built to kind of search huge parts of the parameter space. So I didn't give it an initial condition. I just gave it a range and it simulates from probably uniform distribution on that range. And so I'm not sure where it started, but it'll just, it'll go up here and say, oh, this is really horrible. And then it'll just mutate and it'll go to a, a different part of the parameter space. Um, yeah, I mean, they're, they're not all that great. I mean, some are better than others, I'd say. Um, and obviously, like you can always push it to, to, to where the initial estimate is so far away that it, it just gets lost. Um, but that's why it's nice to have the, these things where you can kind of run it and kind of doesn't really matter. Um, so sometimes I'll run this for a little bit and I'll try and get an idea of what's going on. And then I'll get tired of waiting for it and I'll go to some of the, I'll kind of know where to start the parameters and uh, it'll go like much faster. Um, this Gen SA will do uh, simulated annealing. Um, kind of hard to see this thing here, but uh, it's just going to do a couple iterations. Oh no! Um, so that so the simulated annealing is done. You can kind of see that this right. So we got the same, pretty much the same objective function that we got from the the min QA. Um, this is I see this a lot in the work and. Um, I wish I knew how it works, but this is like a, this hydro PSO is a particle swarm optimization. Um, you just see that report a lot in the literature, and I guess it's, there's particles and they swarm. It's, it's, it's something like that. So um, this one takes a little bit longer, um, but it's again, it's it's kind of like a global kind of search, and it's kind of searching large parts of the parameter space, and so it's just going to take longer than these um, these kind of gradient type uh, methods, but it's done. This one kind of gives you a lot of output. And I can't remember if it gives you the final objective function or not. Oops. OK. Are we done? Yeah. Um, and so I just put together this quick little table, just a bunch of R code. It just doesn't look very good on the, on the markdown here. But yeah. All right, let me make this again. So this is just a method. Uh, so we have the method in the first column, and we've got the initial estimates are in the first row, 
and then we've got uh, all the different the estimates from all the different methods. They all come out to be pretty close to be the same. That Nuller mean looks like it was kind of maybe a little bit different than some of the others, and it's generally matching up with what they reported in the paper. Um, and so, um, kind of the the point that I just wanted to show with this is that kind of depending on the type of problem you have, um, like the price you pay for that the moving parts and the optimization is that it's really easy to just get. I don't want that optimizer. I want this one. And it's really easy when you do it this R way. It makes it really easy to sub these in. Um, and then there's other people that are, they've got no clue what MRG solve is, um, but they're developing these optimizers, and it's just easy enough to plug it, MRG solve into 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 doing it. So, and this this the vignette will, is up on the GitHub site, and so you can kind of copy the code and kind of make it. But you know, this you know this seems like a lot of. Uh, uh, when I first started this, this just seemed like it was hard to wrap my head around what was going on and kind of figure it out. But like after you do it like four or five times, you're like, oh yeah, I just, it's just this thing over and over again. It's, it always looks like this. Um, and so you can just literally take this and plug it in uh, to your problem and it'll, it'll work. And um, so, yeah. Yeah, that's for the the differential evolution. Yeah. yeah so that that's the RCPP bug. Ah, I so like that's you you have to roll back. You have to roll back to see that's what I was just doing. I was rolling back to fifteen, and that's exactly what I saw this morning. I'm like, oh shoot, what happened? Yeah. So that's that's what that is. And it's and the bug was a, it's a problem in the random number generator, and so they just it makes these kind of wacky uh, deals. And somebody somebody reported like the day after they put it to cram. So. Um, do you know how to roll out? You know how to roll back? You, you, yeah, you know all that. Okay. So, any questions or comments? I mean, I'll, you know, um, I, we can do the, there's a Sobol sensitivity analysis deal that I can show you. Uh, if you want to, if you want to see it, I can keep, keep talking. Yes, no, or we can, you can, yes, okay. Um, and this is kind of really where um, we're just kind of starting to use this too, and there was a really nice paper. Um, that came out of uh, Florida here. Um, a Sobol sensitivity analysis. Uh, um, and I saw this come out, and I was like, oh, I should really figure out what that is. And then we, we got on this project where we had to do global sensitivity analysis. We're like, okay, I'm going back here to figure this out. And so, um, it works really well. Um, let's see, where is it? This before, yeah. Um, you guys could probably describe this better than I can, but it's just a way to do a global sensitivity analysis, and it's looking at like variability in the inputs and kind of decomposing that, and looking at the relationship with variability in the outputs. Um, and basically, what kind of you kind of generate these random inputs with some kind of variability to it. Um, and then you kind of get, um, it kind of does its magic. Um, and for all the parameters that you're doing sensitivity analysis on, it gives you this um, sensitivity indices. And basically the higher this index is, the more sensitive the model output, the model is to, the, to that output. Um, and so here they did some kind of complicated uh, kinetic uh, model where they've got all these rate constants and you kind of say, oh, this one's really sensitive because it's got this high index, in, index to it. Um, the one that, uh, uh, I mean, there, there's a bunch of nice examples in here. Um, this is for this two compartment Sunitinib pharmacokinetic model, where there's looking at Ka, um, the clearance and the, and the distributional clearance. So we'll do this example. Um, and just so we don't have to go back to the paper, they also did this, um, this viral kinetic model. This is a model for HIV that includes virus, um, uninfected T cells, lately infected cells, and actively infected cells. Um, and so they're just looking at that at the end of like 2000 or day, uh, hours or days, I can't remember, after some really long time. So this kind of this is kind of like a, a disease progression model where the virus is kind of growing and expanding over time. Um, and kind of like the same way we do predictive checks they kind of make this important point that it kind of matters what you do the sensitivity analysis on. 
Um, and so you could kind of, for doing this on the um, on the PK model, we might just say, we might do it on the concentration at the end of the profile or something like that. But that might not be that informative to like the total features of that profile. And so I think in all these examples, um, they do they calculate the AUC and they do the sensitivity on the AUC. And so these indices are really kind of which parameters are most influential on kind of bumping this AUC up and down um, or area area into the curve. Um, and so I just I follow that. So um, and for that, um, uh, let's see. Oh, and I should say like the other kind of point that the authors make here is that like for simpler models you can get away with um, fewer samples. So we need to generate a bunch of samples and look like look at how this all this variability in the inputs kind of correlates with the variability in the outputs. And so for a simple model you might have to do like like a thousand of these uh, param these uh, simulated uh, parameters, but for a complicated model model you might have to do m many more like a hundred thousand or something like that. So this is where like this. The more complicated model with the more number of parameters, you might have to do a large number of simulations. So these get kind of long, but I don't think they're too bad. Um, I'm just going to restart this. Um, and again, it's kind of like taking the uh, this the kind of one of the other themes that it, that we kind of wanted to point out is that like Emergy Solve doesn't do sensitivity or it doesn't really do sensitivity analysis, but there's people that make packages that will do the Sobel sensitivity analysis for you. So there's this package called sensitivity and they've got like a, a ton of different ways to do this sensitivity analysis. I don't understand the difference between them. I just picked one just to show as an example. Um, but this is just a Sunitnib. It's a Poppy K model. Um, and I'm just going to take this and just zero out the random effects. And so we're really just doing two compartment PK model, I think. Um, we're, we kind of just, all the covariates are at the reference value, and so we're just, we probably didn't need to do a model this complicated, but I'm going to do this dosing event. So I'm going to make a little function here that just says uh, SUN EV. It's just going to, uh, when I call this, it's just going to create an event object for me that has the typical dose. Probably didn't need to do this, but it's just like this. I was kind of tinkering around with the model, and I wanted to do a bunch of different doses, so I just made this little function that would just uh, give me the dose that I wanted. Like this is the type of function that I might be put in that emergency cell uh, TK. And it's just some R code that generates these samples. Um, and I won't go through all of it, but I'll just show you what the result is. Um, uh, uh, yeah. So I'm going to set the seed because we're, uh, we want to be reproducible here. So when I call this gen samples function, it's going to generate those samples. Um, So this is giving me a, a list of length two. Oh, that's it. And so, uh, uh, so I've got two data frames, and I've got my parameters here. So clearance, VC, KA, Q, and uh, VP. And it's just simulated. Uh, uh, I think like uh, so. Basically, what this did, uh, it, is it looked at the param the parameter estimates that were in the model. And it's simulated from a uniform distribution that was 100 times that and 0.01 times that. So just looking at like much larger and much smaller than that, and they just did it. We just did it from a uniform distribution, um, and that's what all these samples are. And these are just random samples. And we're trying to connect this 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 uh, variability in these parameter values with the 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 variability in the in the in the AUC for the output. So we've got. Um, so we've got two times 60,000 uh, samples. So there's uh, 120,000 runs that we're going to do. Um, you might have seen in the model that um, this is where this really makes a difference. So if you're just doing PK, like always do this closed form solution because when you do this repeated simulation, it's just it'll get you like an order of magnitude faster than ODEs. So it's just like nom nom. It's just it just makes such a huge difference if you can do this closed form solutions. So the function in the sensitivity analysis is called Sobol 2007. That's what I did. And there's other ones in there, and I just don't know the difference between them. Um, and basically, this is going to take a little bit um, uh, to run this. Um, 
And so basically what it's going to do is it's going to call the, the, mo the model uh, 120,000 times, and it's going to calculate the AUC for each parameter set, and it's going to fiddle with the, it's going to try and figure out the variability in that AUC because it knows the variability in the input. Um, uh, so that's it. Um, and basically, and this is what you get for the output. So uh, that Jansen or the the sensitivity package just returns an object that you can just you can just plot it, and it'll make this plot where it's looking at the these indices for the main effect and the total effect um, for the different for clearance and TVVC and TVKA and all of them. And this TVVC was the was the most sensitive uh, parameter. And I think they give some I don't know somebody somewhere gave some advice on like how how big this has to be before you can kind of consider it. There's like a rule of thumb to say, well, it's kind of significant or it's not statistical significance, but it's sort of like meaningful. Yeah. So this is like this was my hypothetical Yeah, I think that's what this uh, total effect is. Mm -hmm. So that's like this kind of marginal effect. I'm kind of looking around to make sure that somebody's read the paper too. And yeah, so that, that includes like this sort of marginal effect of the parameter and like the total effect of all the uh, that with all the other parameters in there. It's considered one parameter at a time, right? Not the interaction, let's say, with clearance and KA and how to that. Yeah, no, I think it does, it does all that. that. Yeah, because, right, cause, because we sent in this matrix of all these parameters varying together. Um, maybe I don't know. Um, yeah, it's got um, so they're basically looking at these first order indices, um, total indices. But like this thing, this 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 the the thing that they give out is uh, this might be just way too much. There. There's other stuff you can dig into there, and so you can kind of look into these uh, outputs to try and figure out and that you might be able to dig it out in there yep it took a while I mean I don't really like packages that are that work like this where you have to kind of you have to do something to get the data out because they the, I didn't really like the plot very much um, but it didn't take too long to kind of figure out how to pull this stuff out um, I'll do the HIV model this um, and I'll just this thing takes this thing this thing kind of takes a while and I don't know if I'm doing too many parameters or what but um, I did 8,000. Let's just bring it down back down to four, so we're not here all day. Um, this is a uh, this was kind of nice too. So they the authors published all the source code and all the source um, so the boundaries. So I found this to depend a little bit on the boundaries you pick, and so I had to go into the paper and I picked these are the parameters that they were uh, doing sensitivity analysis on. I really had to match up with uh, with those parameters that they tested, um, and so that just puts this into a data frame. And then I just made a slightly different function to go through, and um, this is what I like to automate in the package to just go through and um, make these uh, these sample sets. But it's kind of the same thing. It's just parameters and columns, and then these uh, random samples in the in the rows. And uh, so let's just try this. So this is doing four four thousand times the number of parameters uh, times two. Um, and I'll just kind of fire this off and maybe we can do like Q&A or something. I don't know. We'll see. Um, this one, uh, I mean this, so like it turns out like that the, so they, so they, they do AUC for their metric and it turns out that like calculating the AUCs on this like almost takes as much time as like simulating. So it takes a long time to go through and do that AUC calculation like 120,000 times. And so what I did in the model is I just, um, I just did this kind of AUC trick where I put in another compartment and I just integrated the viral load. And so I can get the, so I can do the simulation and I can just read off that last observation and get the cumulative AUC. And that, that ends up being like a huge, huge time saver um, for this. I almost gave up on doing this because it was just, it took so long and then I figured out that it, it takes a long time just to do that AUC calculation. Um, but I'll fire this off and we'll kind of see if there's any other questions or comments that it, it's, I mean, it doesn't take like an hour or anything like that, but it might take like a couple of minutes or something like that. So if anyone has any comments or questions or...
any other loose, loose ends that we can tie up, um, I'd be happy to, to, to answer. Model, yeah. The gamma parameter. Yeah. What is the gamma parameter? Yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah, I can't explain it. So they they kind of reparameterize this, the model, and so it's like a hybrid parameter. Um, I can go in the model here. So if I'm thinking like Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I gotta go. Just you, you gotta work, just kind of work through the math, and just, they, and I, did, I didn't really pick up on like why they did that, but it's just like some hybrid parameter that they thought maybe could do better in the estimation or something like that. I don't know. Um, is it done? I think so. So this is where I I kind of went in and I grabbed that stuff out from that object because I just wanted a better looking plot. Um, and uh, so this is the plot that I that I came up with. Um, so the the total order the total uh, order is in the orange, and then the first order is in the green. Um, and then these there's apparently some kind of bootstrapping procedure that it does to generate these confidence intervals around the indices. Um, but it was kind of easy. It was like you know I didn't know a whole lot about it, but somebody else that did did this package, and I just hooked right into it and got the simulations out, and you know. I probably should learn a little bit before kind of getting too far into it, but it was nice to just l piggyback on somebody else's work to, to get this done. So. Okay, I've been talking for a long time, so I appreciate your patience with me. Uh, getting through all this and you know um, I'm excited and so I like love to talk about it so I, sometimes I just go off here and there so I appreciate you everyone coming to this and just uh, please be in touch if problems with the running the examples or ins installation we're again we're happy to help and uh, hope to see you at uh, Page or ACOP and uh, down the road so thanks. thanks again to Florida for yeah yeah Yeah, and the ISOP student committee, I think, did a lot to, to get everything organized. So, I mean, they've been, like, great. I mean, they, they're way better than any student committee that we had when I was a, when I was a student. So, kudos to you guys. So.